The story of side order, the idea actually came about about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I had this idea for a, a two-act Christmas play. Uh, the play would take place entirely on Christmas Eve in a snowed-in diner. Um, I love the, the idea of people from different walks of life, people that didn't know each other, whatever, interacting with each other and learning more about each other in a Christmas setting. So that was the original story, but I never got to, to do it. Um, never wrote it, just always bounced around in my head. Um, so we fast forward 10, 15 years, and we were doing the movie Soaring. I'd written it, and at the same time we were doing Soaring, we were starting to practice the upcoming Christmas play. And I'm in the Christmas play, and I have reached that age along with most of us that were inside order where memorizing lines is not the easiest thing to do. And uh, Don Donaldson uh, was directing, and he is a taskmaster, and he just beats you to death to, to memorize your lines. And I just couldn't do it. And like, so I'm working on this other movie. And so, we finish up and we're working on the Christmas production for 2008, which was a play called Johnny Unforgettable. It was basically a little murder mystery, Maltese Falcon type thing. And um, so we're working on it. And I think I had talked to Bobby about, I said, you know, we had talked about it over a couple years before that, that we could do a movie. Um, you know, it was soaring showed that maybe that's not out of the realm to do a movie. Soaring was set up, it was basically seven, originally six chapters, uh, and uh, basically it took Daryl's sermon every single week, took those notes, and a scene was written based on those notes, and if you went along, you were basically telling a story that set up that week's sermon. Um, so we did that, and I think, I think it kind of showed that Maybe we are onto something. So, we're doing Johnny Unforgettable. It's going horrendous. I'm playing the lead. I can't remember anything. I can't concentrate. And I'm thinking about, why don't we, you know, we can do a movie. We can do a Christmas movie. Um, and so I started, I mentioned to a couple of people about an idea we could do a Christmas movie. So I'm playing around with that idea while we're working on this play. Uh, it was in October of 2008. Uh, I still have the email. I'm fortunate I've kept all these emails. It tells the history of everything. Uh, I sent an email to Bobby, and I think I copied pretty much everybody on the staff here, that, you know, we can do this. I have an idea. We can do this. The problem is, how do you take a two-act Christmas play that's in your mind and stretch it and make a movie? Uh, with no budget, uh, there was the trick. And so I, for a couple weeks, as we're working on Johnny Unforgettable, I'm thinking about this, thinking about this, and I remember the day I'm riding through St. Elmo, right there at the railroad trestle, and it hit me as if God just dumped it down. Here's how you do it. And I sent the email, and I, Bobby's got a copy. We all have copies of that email, the October 26, 2008. Here's, I have an idea, we can do this, and I, I can explain it to you a little bit later, but I'm telling you, it's going to be great. That was my famous words, it's going to be great. So, we kind of pushed that to the side. Let's get this Johnny Unforgettable thing going on. And Bobby was helping, and Bobby saw that, it just wasn't working. Uh, and we're a month out, and we, this is not good. We're gonna do a Christmas play, and we, it's just not working. So we said, well, let's just make it a movie. And went to Don and talked to Don. And Don said, you know, if y'all think we can do it, let's do it. And at that point, honestly, we didn't have any choice. We took a week off in November. And I remember Bobby and I rode around and we checked out locations of how we could pull this off. We were going to take a two-act Christmas play and make it a two-act Christmas movie. And uh, we turned around and shot that movie 
in basically two weeks, we had original music. I, I'm really quite proud of it, but I think only maybe 10 people saw it, and I don't know, there were more saw it than that. But it really turned out pretty good. We shot it black and white, and we pulled it off in time, and we showed it in the Joy Building as part of kind of a, a dinner theater kind of thing. Well, I remember standing in the back of the theater one night, watching, and we had a packed house, but of course, packed house, 200 people. Uh, and every performance was packed, but there again, couple hundred and but we saw yes we can do this let's do this so come January the first thing I want to do is find a location that's the star we got to find a location and when you're doing the things that we're doing and you're trying to do them with no budget uh, the location is very integral Something that you can get free. Um, so I'm riding around. First thing I thought of was Roy's. I grew up in Rossville. Uh, Roy's had been part of my life. Uh, I have stories from my family that date back to the early 40s at Roy's. So I drove over there and stopped, went to the window. Uh, of course, it's all locked up, been closed for years. And I'm looking inside and I thought, it's too small. I even called back to Bobby and said, it's too small. Will not work, just will not work. I looked at a good 10, 12 other spots over the course of the next six weeks. Finally, I'm coming through Chattanooga. I'm at the red light there in Rossville. Roy's is to my left. I'm looking over at Roy's. It's a cold February day and I look to the right and just down the street is a little restaurant on the corner. This place was perfect. Absolutely perfect. This, this layout is a perfect L. Everything about it was perfect. Got the fella's number. I'm going to call him up and see, you know, he, he probably won't lend it to us, but can we rent it for three months? Uh, I turned around and looked back at Roy's. And I walked over to Roy's and looked in the window again. And no, I didn't hear voices and there were no angels talking to me. But it was like, let's shoot this at Roy's. It makes no sense. It's too small. Uh, there's a ton of work that would have to be done just to clean it up. Also, who owns Roy's? So I called back and said, we're going to shoot at Roy's. I'm going to find who owns this. Here come the phone calls. How do we get this place? Went through Rossville Bank, talked to people there. Then Don. Dawson, who was helping, who was going to direct at that time, said, uh, let me talk to Johnny Baker. Most of you know Johnny's the mayor of Rossville. And uh, Johnny knew the fella who had bought Roy's. He lives down in Florida. Well, that's great. The problem is the fella had passed away the year before. He said, well, I've met his widow. Let me see if I can get in touch with her and see if she's willing to, you know, let us use Roy's. Well, that starts a series of emails. I have all the emails talking to our attorneys, to real estate agent. I was making promises. We'll shoot a documentary about Roy's. We'll do all kinds of stuff to help you sell it. Now, all of a sudden, one day, get this email that she has not only agreed, she likes the idea, because I sent her, I think, a synopsis of the story, that she, she loved the idea and that we could use Roy's. And then the good news was not only could we use Roy's, we could use it as long as we wanted, absolutely free. Ding, 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 we've got something to shoot at. Now, getting the power turned on is a whole other ordeal. I'm not even going to go there. That took about a month of just gnashing of teeth. Finally, we get the power turned on. Now we've got the keys. Let's get inside. We open the door and there's a lot of work to be done, needless to say. Basically, uh, there were a bunch of rats who'd set up a restaurant of their own there over the course of the several years. And you bring Myra and Sally and a, a bunch of the ladies showed up, a bunch of the guys, I think Bobby and Stan pressure washed one night over just to try to get the grease off the floors. Because we had to make it presentable because we were gonna be eating in there for one thing, but it was nasty. But we got it all cleaned up. We have a location. 
we had a meeting. I think it was over in the, the Love Building of everybody that was interested in uh, you know, this movie. Bobby had sent out kind of a mass mailing. And we get there, and I'm just going to sit back in the back of the room because Don's going to direct, and Bobby was going to talk about the production side. He gets all of that organized. And we were so fortunate. He would tell you, we had a lot of people helping on the production side. Well, I got to get up there and say a few words. And so I'm talking, and somebody you know, asked about the script, and I had to tell them we don't have a script. And, uh, but it's going to be great. And uh, so we ended up having auditions like a week or so later just to see who would come out. And people came. And they came, and we were, and you got every time the door would open, you'd get an idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I had the final meeting with everybody, and I, you know, I promised them we would get a script, and it's going to be great. Uh, Don and I would write back and forth, and one day Don finally said, "How can you keep saying it's going to be great? We don't even have a script." And I remember telling him. The script is immaterial. I've already seen it. And that truly, it was, I, I, and when I start sit down to read, I'm no master writer, but I sat down and wrote this almost in one take, the whole movie, 200 pages, whatever. Just wrote the whole thing. Now, granted, we tweaked it a lot, uh, and I'm known for revisions, but that's just the way it goes. So write this. Now, casting it. We've seen all the people come through. And to me, it was like there were naturals. It just seemed like that Bobby would be the bad guy. And that I wanted Laura to be a sassy waitress. She can fall out of bed and do that part, all right? So all these parts are just falling into place. But the hard thing was there were, there were three things. The only, th first of all, Marvin Morrison was initially going to be the preacher. And he is the only part in the whole cast that I changed. Because he came to us and said, look, I don't want to be the preacher. He said, everybody expects me to be the preacher. He said, I want to be your short order cook. And we said, all right, you're going to be the short order cook. Beyond brilliant but I had nothing to do with that. The hardest thing was to cast Roy. Roy had, the way he was written was he was a tough, tough man. He had lived a hard life in the restaurant, a restaurant that his dad had started. He had lost his wife in recent years and he was just a tired man but he had a heart about yay big down inside that you had to dig to get to, but you would see it come out every once in a while. So it was gonna take a special person to pull that role off. And we talked, and we talked who can, who, and looked at every age in the world. And then Pat Crow's name came up. Now Pat Crow is I've always, I, he and I have laughed. I said, if, if I've never known a song and dance man from vaudeville, but if, if there is one around here, it's Pat Crow. Pat Crow has a natural humor about him, very intelligent, and I just got, he could, I think he could step up on the stage and entertain for 30 minutes by himself. But could he do a serious, dramatic role? I told him, we got him in, and I talked to him, and I remember saying, you can't smile. You, you have to be tough. And do you think you can do it? And he, he was very confident he could do it. So we have Roy. And I'll be honest, Bobby and I talked about it, I was still nervous all the way up to the first shoot. Could he pull that off? Because I didn't see him. I see him as wearing a funny nose and doing all these jokes. Can he be this guy? And I think the truth came out, yes, he can do that. Now, the only other character that there was some problems with was the character of Chansey. Chansey originally was a smaller role. 
She was a, a, a waitress along with Laura, but she didn't have as big a part. Um, we had worked with Joy Phillips on the other two movies, Soarin' and Johnny Unforgettable. She can do anything. So I, I had her in another part. And then one day it was just hit me. It would be very interesting to have her and Laura bouncing off each other. I think that, that Bobby was the first one to refer to him as almost like a, a Lucy and Ethel kind of thing going on. And yeah, they a lot of what they did was quasi ad lib some of their stuff. Uh, they knew the basics of what needed to be done and you just turn them loose. And I, I, I told them before, I said, y'all made a mediocre script, I think much better by working together. But the, the, the most important casting piece was the character of Leon. And if you go back and you look at the original script, when it identifies each of the characters, the character of Leon, it says in the bio of Leon, a George Wilson type character. Now, at the time George had had, had cancer, he'd been going through radiation and chemo, he was very sick, and I knew he could not do this. He could not be in the movie. So I'm, that was, we had every single thing cast but that. Start looking around who could play this part. And so I decided, well, let's just, let's just don't worry about it. We can go ahead and get started, and then we'll worry about that later. I'm up in Rivermont one day, riding around, and it just hit me. God may have told me, I don't know but I just got the feeling I need to call Steve, first of all, to check on George, but second of all, to kind of tell him what we're doing. So I call him up. We talked for a while, and he said, George is you know, just tired, real tired. Um, he's not able to get out much. And for, for a George Wilson to not be able to get out much and be with people, that had to be extremely difficult for him. I said, well, let me tell you, We've got this part in this movie that we're about to shoot. And it calls for a, a lovable old man who, by his, just his mere presence, just gives you this air, angelic air about him. And I said, uh, it was written with George in mind. And I understand, you know, he's, he doesn't feel good. But if he could somehow muster up the energy to try. We will shoot all of his parts. We'll have him sitting on a stool. He'll never have to get off that stool. If he feels good during the day, we'll shoot during the day. We'll shoot at night. We'll shoot whenever. We'll wrap that building in plaid. We'll do whatever we have to do if he feels like it. And I remember Steve saying, you know, I, I think that would be good for him. He said, let me talk to him. So the next day, George calls me. And we talked for a long time, and he wanted to do it. And I'm like, well, the cast is complete. We, we have something here. Let's get started. We start shooting Side Order. And it took place over, we started, I think, in June. We basically ended up in mid-November. And Don Dawson was directing, and Don was doing a fine job, but he, finally he just couldn't work it in. And then he has a motorcycle wreck. We're not even going to go there on that one, but had, uh, so I had to step in and direct, which was fine. I, I'd, I'd like to direct. Uh, I like to write and direct. That's all I like to do. So I remember my first scene that I directed was the hardware store. Uh, and. It started, it was coming together, it was humor we wanted in it, and, and it's working fine. And so we, we shot all of these scenes before, we wanted to get as many scenes shot before we got to Roy's as possible. Because keep in mind, it's summertime, and this movie takes place the week of Christmas, right? So we have to let you think that somehow we're cold, wearing jackets and such and such. And I, I remember I had a, a fella come up to me after the first showing, and he was kind of 
griping at me. He said, how many restaurants you're saying keep their blinds closed? And I said, well, only a restaurant that would want to make it look like it's winter all year long. I said, we couldn't keep our blinds open because we'd have people walking down the sidewalks in Bermuda shorts and it's supposed to be Christmas Eve. So if you'll notice, for the, for the, I think there's a couple scenes we had the blinds open, but we kept them closed, okay? Now, we finish all these scenes for the most part and it's time to start at Roy's. And the first scene we shot at Roy's was a scene with Joy Phillips and Joy was to be on the telephone. She was getting the news from the garage of how bad a shape her car was in. Okay, so we're all excited we're gonna shoot at Roy's, but the problem is, this is like July. It's 90 something degrees. So we go to Roy's and it's 90 something degrees in Roy's and there's nothing you can do. We couldn't afford to, to fix the air conditioner. Someone heard about there was a, someone who had a portable air conditioner. We thought, man, we had a portable air conditioner, so they got it for us. We could borrow it. We set this, we go over there early in the morning, the day of the, the first shoot, and it's, I'm thinking it was 89 degrees in Roy's. We bring the portable air conditioner in, put it on full blast close the doors because when we come back tonight to shoot, it's going to be frosty in here. We come back that night, we open the door, and it has gone from 89 degrees to 88 degrees. So we're going to shoot our first scenes, and then on top of that, we're going to put our one light shining at joy. Uh, we're ready to shoot our first scene. Now, if you'll notice, if, when she's on the she would do lines and then we'd have to have her face wiped off because sweat beads would get right here. And, but it, that's the, the, we had so many challenges shooting in Roy's. First off, yes, the heat when it's supposed to be cold. You, you cannot imagine how much traffic comes up and down Rossville Boulevard. You can't imagine how many people love to just blow their horn for no reason at all. You can imagine how many transfer trucks drive up through there and slamming their brakes around. And also, you can't imagine how many times the train comes through Rossville. So we had all of these issues on top of the fact that we're shooting inside a restaurant that's about the size of a train car. And we would be in there sometimes upwards of eight actors. And then you turn around, you've got about eight on the crew. You've got 16 people in this building and all of this. With every problem you could possibly think of on a set, we experienced firsthand. So we get rolling and it's time for George to come for his first scene. And I was all excited I hadn't seen George in a while. And George comes and we're, everybody's all happy. And it was the first time Joy got to meet George. And, I, and we had talked. It was real important for Joy and George's character to really intermingle, work well together. We sat down and, and George was nervous. He had been out in forever. And he, he couldn't remember his name that day. And I can remember sitting beside him as close as I could get to him and feeding him a line because he was playing off of joy. We went line by line by line. Before the day was out, you could tell, first of all, joy loved George. And trust me, George loved joy. And after that first day, from then on, when George walked in, and he sat on that same stool, he became Leon. And you, you would see this magic as we, as we went along over the months. The part of George's son in the movie was to be played by Mike Hobbs. I talked to Mike and sent him an email and he said, yep, if you need me, just let me know. And it really wasn't that big a deal. He'd come in, hug him, you know, Merry Christmas, Dad. Then he had a few lines with Joy. And it, so, so it's the Sunday before we're to shoot on Friday night. We're going to shoot that scene. And this is November. We're toward the end of this whole thing. And I'm in church on Sunday morning, and the service ends, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, Steve Wilson should play. George's son. 
So before I left, I, t I, I think I sent him an actual email. I've got the email. Uh, look, and I, I remember saying, I know this is probably going to sound stupid, but would, you know, we're shooting a scene this Friday night. Would you be willing to be George Wilson's son? And I got a response right back. It would be an honor to be George Wilson's son. Okay. Now, for people that know their story, this was an extremely emotional moment that was about to be set up. I talked, Laura knew that I had just sent message to Steve. I sent word back to Steve and told Laura, I said, we've got to keep this absolutely quiet. No one knows. The only people that knew were Laura, of course Steve, and Bobby. And when we got there that night, we told Cliff, because Cliff's the cameraman. So we had done a good job of keeping it hush. And the reason I wanted to keep it quiet was I wanted to see a natural reaction out of joy. I don't know why I wanted to see a natural reaction out of joy. Plus, I thought we had something special, and I really thought of it, it was special for the whole crew to get to see this, not knowing actually what we're about to see. It comes to that Friday night, and we had it coordinated that Donna Kate's husband, Eddie, was going to be the stunt daddy, or, or stunt son, excuse me, that, that we were going to use. And we, we set it up, and I had Steve to get into the parking lot. I don't remember what time, but he was in the parking lot. We had to contact him by, by cell. And I think Bobby went out there and worked with him and kind of went over his lines of how he's going to do it and whatever. And so I had Eddie come in first time. We do it. That's great. Okay, let's try it this way. Eddie comes in. We did it three times with Eddie so that everybody knew exactly how they're supposed to do this. And I finally, I remember saying, you know, okay, this is going to be our keeper, okay? And I remember, I specifically said, all right, he's going to come in, we're going to do this, no matter what, stay in character. And I remember emphasizing that, stay in character. Walked Eddie outside, and Bobby and, and Steve were standing there. And I remember telling Steve, you know, just, he knew, come up behind George, grab him, and say Merry Christmas, Dad. I remember I went back in, and I am standing in front of George. George is right there, and I went, action. Steve walks in, and you can see Joy's face. She's like. Oh my gosh, what in the world? And, and Laura, they both had that look of what in the world? Because first of all, we had set it up in the movie that his son didn't even exist. Steve, and it was just by accident, actually walked down the wall behind George so that you don't see his face. If he had come straight to him, it wouldn't have been quite as impactful. He comes right down by the wall and he turns and he comes in to the camera view and he grabbed George and he wished him Merry Christmas. Well, George laughs and then that laugh became tears. And then everybody's crying, but everybody there was smart enough to know to be quiet. What happened over probably the next 30 to 40 seconds was something I will remember the rest of my life, and we have it on tape, where they have this moment, and you hear them, and it is so real. It is real. And I remember I'm leaning against the back counter, and it's like I'm, it's almost like God just leaned over and just breathed into the restaurant. And we're like, and I remember working my way up to say the word cut because you just didn't know when. You remember I had said, no matter what happens, stay in character. Merry Christmas, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. George, if you'll watch it, he almost literally just sucks it up. 
pushes his plate back. And Girl, says, this, this is my son. Now that, <laughs> that will raise bumps on your arm. It was a moment I will never forget the rest of my life. I respect what the people in the movie did. I, I've said it and I'll say it again. Uh, the acting in our movie, I will put up against any acting I've ever seen in a faith-based movie. We're talking about people who had never, ever done something like this before. We're talking about people who have never been in a play or any kind, and they stepped up and got completely out of their comfort zone and did their role. That the central characters there at the restaurant, they all became their characters. Laura became Reese. Joy was Chancy. Pat was Roy. Marvin, Lord, Marvin was Swerving Mervin. Uh, Bobby became this greasy, hate his guts, real estate guy. He became that person. So that when it came down to the now famous scene 52, I was in a room with these characters. I was not in a room with Bobby and Laura and Joy. No, I'm in the room with these characters. And they had been working for so many months and they knew their character. And when it came down to scene 52, which is by far the longest scene of the movie, we were doing stuff one take, one take, one take. These people were nailing their stuff. And I had put pressure on them. I, Bobby mentioned earlier in the video where I put pressure on him from almost day one because his monologue that he would deliver there when he realizes I own this restaurant. I said there's a pacing there that has to, it is a, there's a scene out of one of my all-time favorite movies, Field of Dreams, where James Earl Jones has this pacing in this scene and I would go over pacing with Bobby to how this, there's a pacing here, this is the way it's delivered. He came out and nailed it in one take. I own that building. I own that building. I just don't think I can afford it. Yeah, you could afford it. I, I, I don't know. Roy, she's right. This town needs a place like, like this. It's a, it's a place where friends can come and share stories and their good times and even their bad. This grill is not this building. It's you. It's you. It's even me. Funny. It took a bowl of banana pudding to make me realize that. You can afford it, Roy. How much are you talking? Take a BLT, heavy on the B, light on the T. Start order fries and sweet tea. <laughs> and I'll put it in writing. Marvin Morrison. I thought the big deal with his character is, you know, first of all, you had to love a guy who's, who's a short order cook but sees himself something bigger and truthfully sees himself bigger. I thought it would be a big deal for him to be able to deliver his piece and come out from behind the kitchen. Now, 
he worked on that a lot. And he would tell me. And he said, I remember him telling me, he said, I worked on it and worked on it. And he said, I'd cry and I'd do it and I'd cry. And he said, and I knew it was something when I did it for my wife and she cried. He didn't know anything about the movie, but he just did this monologue. He comes out that night to do his piece. And I'm leaning against the, the uh, cabinet's action. He comes out and he says, Hey, everybody. I, I got something I need to say. Roy, you remember your daddy gave me my very first job when I was 16 years old. My daddy had died the, the year before. Me and Mom was having a rough time. I wanted to help her out, so your daddy gave me a job and took care of me. Gave me a job sweeping and mopping these floors. These floors right here helped me get through school. I grew up right here. Graduated. Got to thinking that that was a, a whole great big old world out there that, that I just had to see. So I left this little, little hick town. I guess you could say I've, I've seen a lot of pretty things too. I've seen the Statue of Liberty and went all the way out to California and saw the Golden Gate Bridge and I guess just about everything in between. I was even at the Grand Ole Opry the night that, that Garth Brooks came out on the stage very first time. <laughs> I guess I've seen it all. But none of it compared to that floor right here at Roy's. That grill back yonder, hearing those hamburgers sizzle, hearing folks out here laughing and talking, and knowing that, knowing that y'all are my friends. Don't let anybody ever tell you that if you leave home, you can't come back again. Because I did. Roy, it's been a pleasure being your cook all these years. I really appreciate it. And that was another one of those moments where I couldn't say cut. I was seeing magic in front of my eyes, and I'll always think that I was seeing. God was breathing in there. I'm telling you he was, and it was beautiful. Uh, I have so many favorite scenes, but my favorite line of the whole movie, I think several people probably know, was the scene where Laura uh, and Danny Dempsey, Danny played this great, just tough, construction guy who just softy and whatever and and all this whole time he he had you know he was in love with Reese and Reese just never could find a man there's no good man out there and she didn't realize that the right one may be sitting there all alone and when Danny hands her that necklace that she had been wanting that she went to the jewelry store to buy she had her eyes on it for months and it was gone and she's all upset because he had went and bought it and he gives that to her and then first off to see the way he'd softened up that was good acting to see the way that Laura went from this wise cracking Reese to just oh my gosh then to see Joy Phillips in the background with her facial expressions all ad lib reacting to every line that was taking place here and we're bouncing back and forth, and this is just good stuff. Then comes the line. We'd gone over it with George exactly how to deliver this line. It's when Danny goes, he's inviting her to a New Year's Eve bowling party. And Laura looks at him and she's like, well, you know, I, I have my own shoes. And we cut and George looks up and says, you know, Sonny, 
You've got to love a woman with her own bowling shoes. That line gets me to this day. The side order to me was the most, I, I got to where I didn't, I, I didn't want to see it. I saw it you know, once, I saw it twice because I edited it. And when you're editing, it's just, you don't want to see it anymore. Uh, I can remember leaning over the computer for a couple of days, just editing the George scene where he meets Steve. And I can remember literally wiping tears with one hand, working the mouse with the other. And I got to, like I said, I didn't want to see it. We did the best that we could do with it. We've, we've laughed with a camcorder and a lot. Uh, our production values were as high as we could, we could get them. And so people that are, I guess you'd say, in the business, I definitely didn't want them to see it. Uh, just not the acting, I was happy with the story. I just, I just wish it, we could have done better. And so I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't give it to anybody. And it was a few months ago uh, that I had a revelation where now uh, I'll stand up very, very proudly, even from the production side. Did we make mistakes? Yeah, we made some great mistakes. If you have an original copy of Side Order, if you look real close, there's a scene where you can see a camera just sitting there. There's a scene where you can see our only light post, our only light. You can see it plain as day in there. Yeah, we made mistakes. But I think that in a lot of ways adds to the charm of it. We're talking about a cast of 52 people, most who had never done anything at all, making a movie. We had a crew of upwards of 20 to 30. Bobby used to laugh. We'd have a, a we're going to shoot a scene this Thursday night. We'd have two or three boom operators, people to hold microphones. And you watch like Rebecca Renner who could hold that thing in place for 10 or 15 minutes, how she could do it, I don't know. You had all these people just jumping in, Myra Cook, Sally, just cooking and cleaning and basically treating us all like their kids. We had a magic moment in that in 2009, those last six months, and I would do it again tomorrow with those people. But like I said, I am proud of Side Order. Uh, I, I am proud of, of, of what we did, and I think God blessed it beyond belief. And yes, it was great.